If you would please turn with me to Ezra chapter 9, Ezra chapter number 9. Now we will be uh, looking at quite a bit of scripture tonight as I believe uh, a lot of the uh, points that I have this evening, uh, I believe these chapters and these verses really speak for themselves. Ezra is a tremendous historical book of the Bible. Um, it, uh, it is written by, to me, one of the most uh, underestimated men of the whole entire Old Testament, the Ezra. Ezra is someone that uh, many historians uh, credit to writing quite a bit of the Old Testament. Uh, some of the historical, uh, historical books, rather, uh, many credit to Ezra. Of course, he wrote the book after his own name, Ezra. Uh, he is a, a priest that God raised up um, at, uh, for to be over the remnant in Jerusalem after the 70 years of captivity. If you remember that God allowed uh, a small remnant under a man by the name of Zerubbabel, who was like a governor, uh, he was of the tribe of Judah, to bring back a remnant to Jerusalem to help rebuild the temple from the pieces of, of, of Solomon's temple, and he was able to do that. They were able to get the temple rebuilt, and then, uh, but when, un unfortunately what happened is that uh, the children of Israel were not consecrated to the Lord enough, even though God had shown them favor and allowed them to come back to Jerusalem from, from, uh, from Babylon, and sadly, uh, the king of, uh, I believe, the, the king of Babylon at the time uh, gave a decree making it freeing any Jew that wanted to go. Any Jew in the entire Babylonian kingdom that wanted to return back to Jerusalem could go. But very few did. And that's sad that so many of the Jews that were in captivity now for these past 70 years didn't want to leave. They did not want to leave Babylon. They wanted to stay there because the road was long from Babylon to Jerusalem. It was uh, uncharted territory. It would be a tough, a tough go about it. Uh, they'd have to reestablish themselves in a land that had been now taken over by the, all the inhabiting tribes of people. Uh, but God promised them that he would drive them all out. <clears throat> God promised that he'd be with them. Uh, and uh, if they would supply the faith and the courage uh, to uh, pay the price, that God would bless them. But sadly, again, very few people wanted to go. And I think the first six chapters of Ezra kind of deal with that idea. But they got there and they rebuilt a temple. And then sadly, though, it didn't take long for the children of Israel uh, to weaken their resolve, lose their faith. And then the, 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 the uh, men especially began to intermarry with uh, the, the ladies of these other tribes, which God had forbade very strongly uh, of, of intermarrying, and this is talking about religion, because he didn't want the children, the, his children's heart to be turned to people that worshipped idols. And so it was not a matter of race, it was a matter of spirituality. You know, the idea of can two, you know, to be not equally yoked, you got a believer and an unbeliever, is what we're talking about here. He did not want his children intermarrying with people that were idolaters, people that worshipped idols that were not gods, that sacrificed their children to idols. Remember Solomon? He had how many wives? 70, right? How many? Too many. Too many. <laughs> and all the concubines. And they turned his heart away from God. And that's what, that was the essence of it. It wasn't, it wasn't just a matter of a Jew couldn't marry a Hittite or a Jew couldn't marry. It had nothing to do with ethnicity. It had nothing to do with race. It had nothing to do with culture. What it had to do with spirituality, that uh, the unsaved would turn the heart away of the saved. Uh, and, and that happened. And so even though God blessed them and brought them back to Jerusalem, they fell into wicked sin. I mean, wicked sin once again. And then 80 years later passed, and God raises up Ezra, a priest, who could have just stayed there in, in a Persia now, is, over, is in charge now. He had a good position. He was in favor with Artaxerxes and did not have to go. But like Nehemiah, he was someone that had a burden to make a difference for his time. And so again, he, there was favor given to Ezra to take a remnant back to Jerusalem. And, this, and, and Artaxerxes paid for it and said, I'll pay for everything. And matter of fact, he basically gave him a blank check. He said, you stop anything you need along the way, whatever you need for your temple, you know, because the temple's now rebuilt. But whatever you need for your sacrifices, whatever you need to serve your God, whatever you need to take care of, you can set up your own magistrates, you can set up your own, basically your, your sheriffs, your the police, your judges, your rulers. You do whatever you want to do, and you have my authority to do it. You're, when, when you speak on my behalf, and I'll pay for it, and I'll support you, and uh, go. Now, isn't that an unbelievable miracle? But again, it's sad, but only a remnant return. And when Ezra got there, he really thought this was, he was excited to go back to Jerusalem because that was his home. You know, he'd never been there, but this was, this was home. This was the city of David. This is where the temple of Solomon had been built. 
And he was heartbroken over what he saw. But, you know, the story doesn't end there. And we're going to look at tonight uh, something that I believe is very instructive to us in our day and time. As we look around our country and as we see what's going on in our nation, but not just our nation and our world around us. And sometimes we, we always are waiting for the bad guys to not be bad to make it so that good guys can be good. You know, the wicked not to be wicked so the righteous can be righteous. But God doesn't have his eye on the wicked in order to bring revival. And God doesn't have an eye on the bad guys in order to move on behalf of a nation or a people or a church or a family or an individual. He looks at his children. And he responds in the obedience of his children. And he responds in obedience of the faithfulness of his people. And our God is a powerful God. Did we forgotten that? And our God is a mighty God. Have we forgotten that? And our God is an able God. Have we forgotten that? Uh, and, and our God can do way beyond Jer Jeremiah 33, 3. Anything we can imagine or think, our God can do. And we got to be careful of not putting uh, and restricting our God in a box of defeat, in a box of discouragement, in a box of despair, because we can't see beyond the bad guys. And we can't see beyond how wicked it is. And, and thus we limit the Holy One of God. If you remember, why did God not do many great works in Nazareth? Because of their unbelief. And I think what we're, we're dealing with in our day and time is very similar to what Ezra was dealing with. There was a lot of unbelief in the land. Yes, things were bad. Yes, things were wicked. No, things were not good. Uh, clearly, the good guys, the bad guys were in charge. But, but it doesn't have to end there. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. If you wouldn't notice with me in verse number 4, Ezra chapter 9, in verse number 4, where the Bible says, Then were assembled unto me, this is now Ezra talking, one, one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel. Now that's a pretty neat little phrase. Trembled at the words of the word of the word of God. The words of God. This is someone who has a real fear of God. What does the Bible say? The fear of the Lord is the what, church? The beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. And my, have we lost that today. The fear of God. Where we, where, we, and that, where we want to please the Lord. And not only that, we fear His awesome power. We fear His awesome retribution of wickedness and unrighteousness. God still is a holy judge. He is. He is a righteous God. And He will always do right. God will always do what's right. But God is just. And God, yes, He's patient. God is holy. Yes, He's merciful. And God will make sure that He chastises or judge according to, according to His word. And, there, and we We've lost, I think we have, we have so much focused on one attribute of God to the neglect of, of many of his others. Now, again, is God love? Absolutely. But is, is love his chief attribute? No. Love, he's no more loving than he is holy. Holy, uh, holy is a chief attribute of God as well. Be holy, didn't God say that for? I am holy. What are the angels, uh, is it the seraphims and around the mercy seat in heaven? They say, holy, holy, holy. So we have magnified one attribute to the neglect of his, of his other attributes to a point that we've lost the fear of God. We don't respect him like we should in our country. We don't fear him the way we should in our country. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying even as Christians, as believers, we don't revere God the way we should. I'm saying in general, uh, we don't in our nation, in our churches. We've lost our reverence for God. We've lost our respect of God. We've lost our fear of God. Uh, the old preachers many years ago, I uh, think of, uh, of, uh, of George Whitfield, uh, he would read his Bibles from his, on his knees. He feared God so much and he trembled at the word of God so much. He didn't feel worthy uh, to ever be standing up and reading his Bible. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. Uh, I'm just giving you an example of where this man was. But he didn't feel like he could ever sit and read the Bible. Uh, but he always felt like he, he was unworthy to open up the wonderful pages of the Word of God. And, and he would read the Bible from his knees. Now, I'm not saying we've got to do that and, and mimic that activity. But all oh, that our hearts would at least feel that way. That there be a there be a trembling at the word of God, and then notice that as we go on, and he goes on to say, um, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and he, he's talking about those that you know had been carried away and came back, and I sat astonished or astonished until the evening sacrifice. So I'm, that, that idea is he's speechless. It is so bad. When he returned to Jerusalem, he was shell shocked. He was speechless. He was devastated. He was horrified. 
He could not believe what he was witnessing. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. Now, let me say something. Did, did Ezra do anything bad? No. Did Ezra, was Ezra in sin? Uh, had, had Ezra been guilty of not obeying the word of God? But notice how humble this man is. He, he, is, he is interceding in a way where, where we understand, he understands the heart of God. Uh, he, he loves his fellow brethren of Israel and Jerusalem. And he, he's taken ownership of God's judgment upon their, their people. And notice how he even identifies himself. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the king of the lands, the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. He's saying, look, it's all our fault. We've earned all this. We've deserved all this. We're, we're getting what we've asked for. Ever since the day of our fathers, we've not learned our lesson. We've not learned our lesson under the, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of Judges when every man was doing that, which was right in their own eyes. We haven't learned our lesson uh, in wanting to have a king uh, rule over us instead of following God. We've not learned our lesson from all the wicked kings we had uh, that led us astray and all the rebellion that we had and all the prophets that we killed. We've not learned our lesson in the fact that God allowed nations to uprise and take over them and bring them into captivity and then deliver them once they humbled themselves. But they get wicked again back into captivity. They'd humble themselves. God would deliver them. And finally, God just said, 70 years, you're in captivity. And now you would think they would have learned their lesson. You'd think that they would have had enough sense to realize that our God is a holy God. Our God is a jealous God. Our God is a just God. We, we need to fear him. We need to revere him. We need to respect him. We need to tremble at his feet. But they didn't learn their lesson. And here they are once again. A new generation falling prey to the same old patterns. But notice verse number eight. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant. There aren't many of us. Not everybody's bowed the knee, bent the knee. Not everybody's bowed the head. Not everybody's confessing Baal. Not everybody's disobeying the Bible. Not everybody's in rebellion. Not everybody's worshiping idols. Not e there are some who fear the Lord. There are some that love God. There are some that revere the scriptures. There's a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in this holy place, another a solid footing in this holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. If you notice with me, verse 13, if you jump down there real quickly, verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds... And for our great trespass, now this is still him praying, seeing that our God has punished us. Can you see the next words, church? Less than our iniquities deserve. Can I ask you a question? Do you believe America is getting more than or less than what we deserve? I believe less than. Don't you believe that? Less than. I believe we're getting less than. And we can look around and we're getting what? We're getting categorically what we deserve. But we're getting less than. And here to think that the whole future of Israel was resting on a faithful remnant. How God would respond would be dependent upon how that faithful remnant would respond. And look, notice what he said, has given us as such deliverance as this. Now notice verse 14. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? I mean, are we, God's going to be merciful to us to go back into that? God's going to forgive us to go back into that? God's going to revive us to go back into that? 
Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? I want to bring just a, a simple thought tonight. I'm making the most of our space. Making the most of our space. Notice again verse number 8, if you would please. Notice what the Bible says. And now for a little space, not a big space, not a large space, not a wide open space, but hey, it's a space. Not, not a grand space, not, not an oversized space, a, a, a little space. But, but thank God it's still a space yep. Amen. of grace, Amen. making the most of our space. Father, bless please tonight. Please help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's something about making the most out of small spaces. There are times where we don't have all the room we want, but we got all the room we're going to get. And we got to make the most of a small space. I remember when my wife and I first got married, uh, we lived in a very, very small trailer. It was an older trailer, and it, it was very small. It wasn't very wide, and it wasn't very long, but it's all we could afford. It's what we had. It was very small. It was two bedroom, one bathroom, and, and the, the second bedroom uh, is the size of most closets, I would think. Uh, and uh, it wasn't big, and our kitchen was not very big. And, and I mean, if we got into the kitchen, we both we had to kind of we kind of had to oil each other up so we could kind of slide by each other, getting by you know things. It, it was tight. Um, it was very tight and very small. Uh, but we had to make the most of it. And there was two of us. And we ended up having two children. Uh, for uh, We had uh, Sarah and Cynthia uh, in that little, little trailer. We lived in that, our, in our, I think, our first three or four years of marriage. We were in that little bitty trailer. And, uh, and we didn't have a lot of space. But we, we had to do the best we could with it. We could mope around and complain about what we don't have and talk about, God, why don't we have a bigger house? Why don't we have a bigger apartment? Why don't we have a bigger trailer? You know, why don't we have a bigger this, that, or the other? But what good was that going to do? Was it going to change our situation? But isn't there something about uh, just doing the best, making the most of what you have? And, and I believe God blesses people that do that. I believe people are truly grateful that, that show character and contentment and just do the best you can with what you have. Those are the kind of people People God will invest in because it's not about the materialism. It's not about just having more because I want more. But I just remember we had to make every single square inch of that place count and uh, make it the most. I, I remember my first office that I had. It was a little bitty thing. It was a, like a broom closet, if you would. Uh, but it was a, a place for me to get away and have my own stuff. And, uh, and I wasn't able to put many things in there, wasn't able to do much. Again, I could complain a little bit about having such a tiny little office and, and uh, you know, not, I don't have a place to, you know, have a, entertain uh, dignitaries. Like I was ever going to entertain dignitaries in my, in my little office. And, uh, but, it was, but, you know, you make the most of what you have. Kind of like tiny homes. My wife loves watching those. And we haven't watched them in a while, but uh, those tiny home little specials, because you're like, it's amazing what they do with all the space. I mean, they got closets everywhere. They got closets in their closets. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They, they find a way to build kitchens and bathrooms and showers and lofts and, you know, and all these, and they just make the most of their space. You know, and I think that's what Ezra is saying. Sure, I'd love to have a wider open of area for God to work. And it'd be wonderful if I had stepped into something here in Jerusalem where they were already having revival and people were already serving God and there was a, a multitude of people that feared the Lord and that we weren't on the verge of utter destruction because, boy, they were. But I said, you know, we just have a little space of grace. But at least it's a space. At least it's some space. So instead of, you know, focusing on what they didn't have, and instead of, and now he, he was, he was uh, repentive, and, but that's part of making the most of his space. And he was beseeching the Lord's mercy, but that was also part of making the most of his space. And he was heartbroken over the sin and debauchery and rebellion around him, but that also was a part of making the most of his space. But he wasn't mad at God, and he wasn't indifferent to what was going on around him. And he was willing to do whatever he had to do to make sure that they were obeying the Bible to get God's blessings once again on their land. He was willing to make the most of his space. Now, I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit in my message because my introduction took care of a lot of my different points. 
But if I can say this, part of the big problem they had was that the children of God had lost their confidence in the Lord, and they were losing their spiritual identity. They were losing their spiritual identity. Uh, they, they had they'd gotten desperate. I don't know why uh, the, the men and the women uh, had decided that, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to get desperate and allow the world to creep in uh, to our thinking and the world to creep into our philosophies. And instead of trusting the Lord and having confidence in God, uh, you know, we're going to try to, to, get a, to, to go along, to get along. And, and if you would turn with me to keep your, uh, if you would look with me and uh, let me see where I want to look at tonight. I'm going to try to skip ahead here. Um, okay, Ezra chapter number nine. If you would look at, I want you to look at, um, all right, verse number one. All right, I want us to notice all these ites. Now, this is Ezra chapter number nine. Okay, and, and notice this. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, now, what's the next phrase, church? Have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Now, let's look at that again. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, so the lay people and the church leaders, what were they guilty of? What were they guilty of? and not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Now hold your mark there. Go with me to 1 John 2. I think we need to go there real quickly. And then we're going to go to Deuteronomy 7. Again, I feel we're guilty in our day and time of over-magnifying attributes of God that are more appealing to our flesh. Is God merciful? Yes. Is God gracious? Yes. Is God kind? Yes. Is God loving? Yes. Is God compassionate? Yes. But is he more of those things than he is holy? Is he more of those things then he is just. Is he more of those things? No. Whatever God is, he's eternally of that. And he's never one thing to the detriment of another. And they don't contradict each other. And he never weakens in one in order to be stronger in another. And in our day and time, again, we have over-magnified the love of God. And uh, how can you over-magnify the love of God to a point where we, we, we believe that God is tolerant of evil because he's so loving? Where God doesn't care about worldliness because he's so loving? Where God doesn't, 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 doesn't draw lines in the sand with what is wicked and what's... Where he doesn't mind people disobeying his word. And he doesn't mind if people really have a reverence for the scripture. He doesn't really mind how people live their lives as believers because he's a loving God. That, that is abusing the doctrine of the love of God. That's abusing the doctrine of love of God. That's misusing the love of God. I, I feel like as a parent, I was a loving parent. I feel like I loved my children with all my heart as much as I could at each stage of their lives. But to say, well, I love my children so much and to prove positive, I always let them eat what they want to eat. I love them too much to restrict them. I'm going to always let them eat what they want to eat. I love my children too much to tell them that you got to go to bed at a certain time. Well, I'm not that kind of a mean parent. I see parents that are so legalistic and they're so mean. And the fact that they set bedtimes for their children, well, they ought to let their children decide what time they want to go to bed. Well, school is, is up to them, whether they have a heart to learn or not to learn. I don't want to force education on my child. I don't want to force reading and I don't want to force math on my child. I remember I was made to go to school. And I've got wounds. I'm emotionally abused by my parents for making me go to school when I didn't want to go to school. Personal hygiene, you know, some people have it, some people don't. <laughs> Having good dental work is not for everybody. If you want to brush your teeth, brush your teeth. If you don't, don't. They're your teeth. You know, I'm a loving parent. I'm a kind parent. I'm a merciful parent. Hey, Dad, I just wanted to let you know, I know you said we're not supposed to be throwing a ball in the house, but I want you to know we were doing it anyway, and we broke three windows. Oh, I forgive you, son, because I can tell you're very repentant, and, you know, I'm merciful. And I want you to know I'm merciful. Now, wouldn't you agree that that borders on insanity? 
John Mark says that would have been nice. <laughs> no, because I am a loving parent, I'm going to love them even if it means I've got to chastise them. And I'm going to keep them from doing wrong. And I'm going to teach them what is right. And I'm going to, I'm, I, there are times that they're not going to like my tough love. Well, we've gotten to a point in today's Christianity. You know, there's a word I used this morning, and I almost want to build a whole message on it. Fusion, faith fusion. Where we, we take some things of God or some, some beliefs of Christianity, but we merge with that some worldly philosophies and activities. And it's a fusion. We come to a point where we so magnified certain attributes that appeal to us the way we want God to be. We're making God in our own image. Do we expect God not to judge homosexuality? God not to judge murdering babies inside what's supposed to be the most sacred place, the special place, the safest place, the womb? We don't think God is going to judge transgenderism and the mutilation and physical abuse of a mental disorder. When people are anorexic, that's a mental disorder. Am I right? Yeah. Anorexia is a, have you, I've, known, I've known someone that was. And every time they look in the mirror, they thought they were fat. But really, they were skinny as could be. We don't look at someone who's anorexic and say, well, they just, they, I know they're, they're skinny, but in their mind, they're a fat person, so we're going to deal with them like they're fat. No, we know they need help. We know they need help. We get them help. When a 7-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old is confused about something they ought to be confused about, we ought not let them or even encourage them to make life-altering decisions that you can't reverse. Right, right. Yeah. Right. They get help. You don't think God's going to judge that? You say, well, Pastor, this is politically incorrect. You're making me uncomfortable. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. That, if this makes you uncomfortable, that's a problem. If this doesn't stir you up, doesn't challenge, you know, because, well, I know a lot of people, because we've been, we've been pressured to believe certain ways. We've been, we've been told that we're evil and unkind and unloving, and if we don't live and let live, and if we, you know, and if we're, we're this kind of phobic and that kind of phobic, and this, well, I think you're truth, I think some people are truth phobics. I think they're Bible phobics. I think they're I think they're holy phobics. And but you you follow but people that allow the butchering, and that's what it is, it's butchering and mutilating of young people that need different type of help. Do they do they do they stay with them? Do they know where this is still experimental? If they want to do that when they're adults, this then then have at it. But you know how the, the, the percentage of suicide among that crowd is high? And it's not because people reject them. It's because they get all these chemicals inside of their body. It's messed with their mind. They're emotionally all over the place. They can't, they can't function. And all, people are always going to blame someone for their problems. There's always the victim card to play to justify why I do something stupid. Well, this is all not part of my initial message. So now I've got to really cut out some spot. But we've over-magnified. I believe the greatest crime in America today is not homosexuality from God's standpoint. Well, it's going to be real controversial. Buckle up, buttercup. It's going to be real controversial. I don't believe the biggest crime in America, from God's viewpoint, is transgenderism. From God's viewpoint. I don't even believe it's abortion. From God's viewpoint. Because God never starts with the world to begin with. What was the biggest crime, from God's viewpoint, going on in Jerusalem? The disobedience of his children. Amen. And following the ways of the world. 1 John chapter 2, you there? Verse, look at verse 15. 
I believe this is the greatest crime in America from God's viewpoint. God's people loving the world more than him. I believe that's the biggest crime in America. I don't believe God's withheld held his hand of blessing. See, there's, the, see, there's two things. There's God's hand of judgment, and there's God's hand of blessing. See, because of the cross and because of the resurrection, we're not living our lives to withhold the hand of judgment upon us. We're not living our lives to have the hand of blessing upon us. We live our lives to be blessed to God. We don't live our lives to not be judged by God. We live our lives to have God's power upon us. We don't live our lives so God doesn't kick us off to the curb. Look, you, we, it's, it's reversed. We're not just trying to get by with the bare minimum to get in the least amount of trouble from God as we can. Oh, no, we want to live our lives in such a way where we can have maximum power and maximum blessings and maximum favor of God because where God's blessings are and where God's hand is and where God's power is, uh, it, it takes care of a lot of those things things that require God's chastisement. It takes care of a lot of those things that require God's judgment. If we get God's blessings upon our lives again and in our churches again and in our homes again, there will be fewer and fewer and fewer things that require God's judgment. We quit waiting for bad to stop being bad and wicked to stop being wicked. And God says, when will my children start being good again? and start being righteous again, and start living holy again, and tremble at my word again, and fear me, and revere me, and respect me. Verse 15. This is the longest introduction I've ever preached. And I'm going to have to close my introduction. Love not the world. Do you see that, church? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, what does the Bible say? The love of the Father is not in him. In other words, the love for the Father, the, the Father's love. We won't have the capacity to love God the way we should. If I love, the more I love the world, the less I will love my Father. What is the chiefest commandment given in the Bible? Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. That's the greatest commandment in the world. So if I am loving the world, then I'm not loving God, and I am breaking the greatest commandment in the world. What's the greatest commandment? Thou shalt not kill. That's not what Jesus said. What's the greatest commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's not what Jesus said. What is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. So if I disobey that command willingly, I am doing the greatest, making the greatest crime. And here's, here is the number one enemy of that command. It's the world. It's the world. It's always been the world. It's always been the world. It's always been the people of the world around us. It's always been the ways of the world around us, the fashions of the world around us, the philosophies of the world around us, the, the, the values and morals of the world around us. It has always been the besetting sin of God's people. There's no new thing under the sun. Why can't we in our day and time wake up within a church of God and realize this is not going to pass either? And it's not because of the White House. And it's not because of one party versus another party, politically speaking. And it's not because of what's going on at the schoolhouses, which is bad. It starts with us. Amen. Notice verse 16. Good. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh to do, the lust of the eyes to have, the pride of life to be. What does the Bible say? It is not of the Father. But is what? Of the world. Didn't James say that the friendship of this world is enmity? Yes, the adulterers and adulteresses. Amen. How can we say we love God 
And we love his enemy, a world that hates him, despises him, hates his word, hates his truth, hates his son, hates everything to do with him. How can we say we love God? The greatest crime being committed in Christianity is the same crime committed back in the book of Ezra. Where, where did I read again? What was my last verse I read? I'm just probably going to make this my message. 16. Thank you for, for that. What chapter? <laughs> Eight. <laughs> I'm all over the place tonight. First John 2. Oh, no, I'm, I'm in Ezra where I talked about, uh, I think, was it verse in chapter 9? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. I knew that, by the way. <laughs> you all passed the test. Look at verse number one. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, okay, this is, this is it. This was the problem. Have not separated themselves from the people of the land. Now, in doing so, in, in doing according to their abominations. And he goes on to list a bunch of ites. Now, where I was going to go to, and I'm not going to go there now, was the Deuteronomy chapter number 7, where the command was given through, by God through Moses, when I bring you into a land, this is the promised land. He was foretelling, when you go into the promised land, and he named a bunch of ites that they were going to encounter when they got into the land. This was when Moses was still alive. I believe several hundred years have passed. And God told them in the book of Deuteronomy, I want you to utterly destroy these wicked people from off. Because God was using, God used wicked people to judge the righteous, right? God was using the righteous people to judge the wicked. God is just. He gave them a lot of, remember God didn't let, why, remember when, 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 when Abraham was given the promise of Canaan? He wasn't going to let him get into the land of promise for, it was like 400, it was 400, over 400 years. Because the iniquity of the land had not, they, they, God was given, God give, gives people a chance to repent. There, God is, remember, God's always just and merciful. God's gracious. He's slow to wrath. Great in kindness and mercy. But even God will say, that's enough. So a lot of, but here's what he told them. Destroy all these people. Do you know five of the eight tribes listed there in Ezra are five, five of those eight peoples, those ites, are listed in Deuteronomy chapter number seven. Hundreds of years earlier, God said, get rid of the Amorites, get rid of the Hivites, get rid of the Tiktites. Get rid of them. And they never did. Why is it so hard for God's people to separate ourselves from the world? Who are we trying to please? Who, do we, who are we more afraid of? Who do we revere? We've lost our tremble when we come to the Word of God. Amen. We've lost our revere when it comes to the Word of God. We've lost our respect of the things of God. And now look at what bad shape Christianity is in our day. It's a mess. No, it's a hot mess. It's confusing. It's confusing. It's watered down, and it's worldly. Oh, they use the name of Jesus, and they use the name of God, and they will, you know, exalt a few of his attributes, which are attributes of God, but to, to the total neglect. And these same Christians so-called that believe that they're instruments of blessing 
in our nation. Now, this is a real controversial statement, but I approve of this message. They're bringing a curse. They're bringing a curse. Because in Jesus' name, they're endorsing worldliness. And in Jesus' name, they're endorsing sin. In Jesus' name, they're endorsing and promoting carnality Amen, and saying that God doesn't care. That's good. That's good. Go ahead. If my people right. who are called by my name shall do what? And then what? Turn from their wicked ways. And God says it's a remnant. He's not, we don't have to have a majority. But there has to be someone that still trembles at the word of God. Well, I didn't get out of my introduction. But I believe that's what God wanted us to have tonight. Hey, let's be part of the answer. Let's, let's be, God blesses the remnant. God blesses faithfulness. God blesses obedience. God blesses those that want to please him with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind. And let's not put God into a defeated box. Our God's a big God. No one cares more about things being righted than God does. Let's be obedient, trust the Lord, and let God be God in our nation again. You know what I wanted to get to and I didn't get to it? was the amount of prayer and supplication, not the amount, but the quality. Charles Purden said many years ago, it's not the length of our prayers, but the strength of our prayers that gets a hold of God. And I believe if our prayers could be strong again and surrendered and yielded, I believe we could see God do great and mighty things in our nation. Father, we do pray bless in our invitation tonight. And Father, I do pray that you would please heal our land. God, we, we are guilty as... As, as could be listed here tonight, we could very easily um, make a long list of iniquities that we have done against you because we don't fear your word, because we don't revere you, because we've lost our blush, we've lost our innocency, we've lost our ability to be convicted of sin, we've lost our desire to, uh, to have the whole counsel of God preach to us as Christians. It's not the world that's watering down uh, Christianity as far as that's their agenda. It's Christians who want to somehow or another preach a message that appeals to the world as they are, that appeals to the world and makes it easier on us uh, to claim that we are serving you while at the same time uh, we are pleasing the flesh and pleasing the world. And it never has worked in the past, and it's still not working today. God, I pray you'd help us as your children Oh, God, help us to examine our own lives. Ezra, he put himself in the pot. He, he put himself in the mix. He took ownership, and he claimed to be part of the problem because he, Father, understood that every one of us can be guilty of this. Every one of us can make allowances we shouldn't do. Every one of us can, uh, Lord, get soft in areas we shouldn't, and every one of us can tolerate in areas we ought not. But, Father, he wasn't just seeking a lack of judgment. Ezra was seeking a hand of blessing. And I pray, Father, that be our heart tonight, that we would see you bless our land once again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet, our heads up.